That's disgusting, Dad says. Don't talk about things like that over the dinner table. So after dinner, the father asked, Now, son, what did you want to ask me? He says, Oh, it's nothing. There was a bug in your soup, but now it's gone. <laughs> If you have 13 apples in one hand and 10 oranges in the other, what do you have? <coughs> Big hands. <laughs> Psalm 40. And we're going to be talking about Psalm 40 today. And the first verse is, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he turned to me and heard my cry. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, as we go into your word this morning, we pray that these morsels... And your guidance and direction will go to right where they, you want them to go and that they will have an effect that you want them to have. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. David waited patiently. This is a psalm of David. He waited patiently, but there was a cry. He turned to me and heard my cry. We don't think of crying out as a sign of patience. We don't think of it that way. So he cries out in his distress. He had a lot of distresses in his life. But he waited for God to answer. He knew that God would come through. Our part is to come to God with our desperation and then wait. In faith, he will answer. Amen. Waiting we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like to wait at a traffic light. We don't like, we like to wait in line at the store. We don't like to wait for a fish to bite. We don't like to wait for a 10 point to come along. We don't like to wait. But if we have faith, we will wait for the things we're bringing to God. We will trust that God will answer in his way and in his time. Verse 2, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, miry clay, I think it says in the King James, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. David's pit is in his past. He's speaking of it in past tense. So it might be when he was on the run from Saul. During that time, he had no security. He had a stronghold that he would resort to. He had 600 men. That's a tiny army compared to Saul. But his enemy was the king. David didn't do anything that deserved Saul's determination to kill him. Sin is a slimy pit. What can be slimier? And the rock is Jesus. Yes. He sets us on himself. He's the rock. He sets us on himself. There can be no safer place than on the rock, which is Jesus. Once we were slipping and sliding, like the rest of the world, can you remember? Were you there? Yeah, because all of us were slipping and sliding in sin like the rest of the world. But now we're in a firm place. His word is a firm place. Verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. David was a songwriter and a musician. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Verse 4, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. People all feel threatened sometimes. Do you ever feel threatened? We're all a pretty good vintage here. <laughs> We've all felt threatened sometimes. That's why so many people in central Pennsylvania carry guns. The bad guys have guns. So why shouldn't we? I know several pastors that carry guns. Nothing wrong with that. 
There are other kinds of threats. The news keeps us aware of the terrible things that are going on in this country and in the world. COVID was a threat. A million people died. You couldn't get near anyone. You couldn't shake hands, you couldn't hug, you couldn't breathe. You had to be cautious about touching anything. When they finally did open restaurants, you had to put the gloves on in there, in the buffet. Inflation is a threat right now. If you're living on a fixed income, you have to tighten the belt because the prices are going up faster than your income is. Food prices, gas prices, they're down a little bit. Eggs are coming down, by the way. Heat cost, these things all threaten us. Threats. David felt threatened. Communism is a threat to our way of life. Marxism is being embraced in the colleges. I don't think they call it that. Marxism hates the nuclear family. Marxism hates organized religion. Marxism hates God because they want to be God. Marxism hates the idea of having private property. They think that if you earn a dollar, it is part of the community's dollar, and they get to decide how much of your dollar you get to have for yourself. That's Marxism, socialism, or whatever you want to call it. It primarily, they think, belongs to everyone. My economic philosophy is I have a right to earn whatever I can with the talent and ability that I have that someone will hire me to do. I have a right to own what I've earned, and I have a right to accumulate what I own. Suggest so that on a college campus today and see where that gets you. Verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Of course, all, of all the wonders that he has done, his greatest is eternal life. <laughs> Salvation is so awesome that it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. It doesn't make any sense. We're all sinners. We all oppose God at some time in our life. But God, the supreme being in his love for us, personal for you and you and you and you, in his, in his love for us, sent his son to die on Calvary to pay the penalty for my sins and yours. Does that make any sense? No, it's not logical. But it's true. <laughs> it's a miracle. Salvation is a miracle. And then, and then he referred, he said, the wonders you have done. He sends the Holy Spirit with conviction so that your spirit can be penetrated by the truth of God's love. Without the Holy Spirit's conviction, people don't repent. It won't. It has to have the inaction of the Holy Spirit on your heart. And then the veil is removed and the Spirit comes in and you realize that you're a sinner in need of salvation. And you capitulate and receive Christ as Savior. That's a miracle. Amen. So now the one who had refused to believe, people that don't believe actually refuse to believe. It's not that they just don't believe, it's they refuse to believe. Can you remember? I can remember refusing to believe. Putting my hand out against God, I don't want to hear this. I can remember being like that. That person now sees the light, turns from the world, and becomes a believer. The wonders you have done, he says. The lame walk, the blind see. There is none so blind as the one who will not see. 
That's a worse blindness than walking around and bumping into things. So the ones who don't believe, refuse to believe, the alphabet people, do you know what I mean when I say the alphabet people? Do you know what I'm talking about? They will either come to faith or they will come to naught. They will either, I'm talking about alphabet, I'm talking about LGB, etc. I'm talking about CRT, etc. I'm talking about W, I won't even say that word. W, it rhymes with joke. Alphabet people, I call them. Yeah. They will either come to faith and believe and receive, or they will come to naught. They will come to eternal grief. Everyone who goes into eternity without faith in Christ comes to eternal grief forever and ever. The alphabet people are against God. All of them are. And though they have an impact on society for a while, they will not prevail. The alphabet movements will not prevail because they're on the wrong side of God. They will lead many astray. And because they oppose God, they will be perish in their sins. They will be in company with Satan and his demon angels forever and ever. Amen. See, Mark and Sherry, these people, they make me beg for amens. <laughs> I used to have to go like this, and so I threatened to make a sign and push a button. So they found they bought that sign for me. <laughs> All I have to do is push a button now. Verse 6, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. The requirement from God has nothing to do with the blood of animals. Hebrews 10, 4 to 10, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Verse 8, going back to Psalm 40. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you, were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Verse 9, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and continuing, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Made holy. Yes. We have been made holy. Without holiness, the Bible says, no one can please God. So by his own sacrifice, he made us holy. You can't make yourself holy. Because it's just self-righteousness and it doesn't appeal to God. But when we receive him as Lord and Savior, we have the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. That means he puts his righteousness onto us. And that's the holiness that pleases God. We don't have sufficient righteousness of our own. So he puts it on to us, his righteousness. And that's what pleases God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We can only become holy and righteous in Jesus. That's the only way we can do it. 
Then he said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. The sense of right and wrong, of what pleases God, is in the heart. Believers know instinctively what pleases God and what doesn't. You know instinctively if you reach for something that doesn't please God, you have a feeling that I shouldn't do that. Maybe you do it anyway. I mean, we're still sinners. But you know when you're wrong. Amen? You know. Can you remember when you needed something from God? The older we get, the more often that happens. Probably all the time. Did you wait patiently, like David said? We might as well wait patiently because God will do it in His time. He's not, so, he's not concerned about your anxious. He's not concerned about your impatience. He's God. It's not up to me when or how God blesses. Father knows best. <laughs> patience is learned. Little babies aren't patient. When it's feeding time or changing time, they let you know. They're demanding. Little kids are demanding, especially babies. <laughs> if you don't learn to be patient, you'll be frustrated. So we have to calm down and wait. Sometimes it's a long wait. Sometimes we wait until we cross over into eternity and then we're made whole. That happens. David is praising God for something that happened in his past. Praise God for what he has done. Wait on him for what you're requesting. Praise and wait. We want blessings. We want prosperity. We want health. I want to be skinny. I used to be half as much as I am now. When I got married, I was half as much. <laughs> I was 115 pounds, and she was 98 when we got married. That was 65 years ago. <sighs> I'm addicted to the ice cream, and I wear it, you know, around here. I want to have a memory. <laughs> I used to have a memory. Now I have to read my sermons. I, I, I can't remember. Mark and Sherry. Three times, I had, but next week, I don't know if I remember. Mark and Sherry. I remember right now, I want this church to grow. I want to be good at something. I want to lead more people to the Lord. I want you to lead people to the Lord. Do you want that too? Do you want to be a soul winner? starts with your family everybody has unsaved loved ones but you know what the unsaved loved ones don't listen to the family but people at work do but they will they will pay attention to how you act and wonder why you have that victory that they don't have and eventually they might say well, you know what is it why, why do you have this peace there's your open door there's your opportunity to share why you have it you know, I went, I, I hinted around, and a, and a guy I worked with finally invited me to go to church. That's how I came to Christ. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What things? All these things that you need. Some things you need and some things you think you need. I think I need some more fly rods. I think I need a red truck. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Do not worry, it says, about these things. Don't worry. 
Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Jesus said to the people in the boat that was thinking, why are you so afraid? Why are you? He was asking that question so they would ask themselves that question. Why are you so afraid? And, and, do not, and why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. And I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, verse 31, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. My Swedish grandmother came here from Sweden. And she, I say, Grandma, can we do this less and such tomorrow? And she said, tomorrow never comes. It's always today. <laughs> today is all you got. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. So what things? All things. Seek first his kingdom. Some seek their own kingdom. Some want everything to happen on their own terms. Seek his kingdom. When we're in his kingdom, we're under his authority. Think about that. When we're in his kingdom, we're under his protection. These things will be added to you. God will take care of the rest. He knows what we need. He will provide. Sometimes we confuse what we need with what we want. I don't see how I can survive unless I get another fly rod. It's on order. <laughs> My boys bought it, bought it for me. They ordered it for me. It's a different kind of fly fishing than I've ever than I've ever done or seen. But I'm going to do it. Don't worry. Verse thirty-one. Don't worry. Can you be without worry? Do you worry about things you can't change? Do you worry about what's happening in the news? Do you worry about what's happening on a political scene? But then a refreshing comes along. The revivals in the colleges. Yes. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Yes. See, so many things that cause us to worry and be concerned, and then a refreshing thing like that comes along, and it's awesome. God will, God will worry, but we'll take care of the rest. He knows what we need. Do you worry about things that only God can solve? Only God can turn this country around. Yes. This country is, is going to have judgment because of murdering 6 million babies. Or is it 60 million? 60 million babies. There's a judgment. We can worry about things we see happening in our country. We can worry about the church. We can worry about our families. We can worry about cancer and other things that might be looming on the horizon. But instead of worrying, use the emotional effort to pray and believe. Emotional effort. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous. Fervent, there's a hated prayer. Go to the altar. 
An altar can be wherever. It could be in your car while you're driving along. It's where you, it's where you go to present your need. And then leave it with God. Present the need and leave it there. Leave it at the altar. And praise God. <laughs> praise Him. God uses energy um, to keep the world going, to keep the world spinning because God wants it to spin. But we need to use our emotional energy to praise God, to believe, and then leave it with God. Amen? Back to the start, David said, David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. So we need to go to the Lord with our needs. That's what he wants us to do. But we need to be patient about how he takes care of it. He will take care of it. He will. We just need to wait on him to be careful to be, to be waiting. Instead of demanding, there are Pentecostal circles that demand. They're, they're demanding. You can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. He's God. He's going to do it however he wants to do it. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? If you have something that you want to bring to God and at the altars here, you can find a place to pray. At the altars or in a seat or anywhere around here, you can stand, kneel, lay. It doesn't matter. But go to the altar. You could, you could sit there and have an altar in your heart and present your needs without saying anything out loud. But we need to have confidence that God will do this. But He's the boss. He's the Father. Father knows best. He'll do it when He wants to do it. He'll do it how He wants to do it. And that's what we need to have faith in. Yes, Lord, I don't see it, but I know you're gonna but I know you and I know you're gonna do this. Some people have to wait a long time. We have we have sons that aren't in church. And one of them's not a believer. They were in church, they grew up in church. So we've been waiting. We've been waiting for I don't know, 30 years, maybe a long, long time. We don't give up. God's going to take care of it. He's going to do it however He wants to do it. We just have to stay out of the way. If they come and ask questions, we answer them. You have unsaved loved ones you've been waiting for a long time. Do you have that? Well, come on down here and Lay him on the altar.